Today the topic is about hemorrhage and hemostasis. As we all know, hemorrhage is nothing but blood loss. In general surgery, what happens is it's mostly encountered with cases of this blood loss conditions and this blood loss can be either acute blood loss or chronic blood loss. Today we will discuss about types of hemorrhages, uh, the clinical features and how do we actually manage hemorrhage and the protocols of hemostasis. So coming to uh, hemorrhage, actually it is of two types. One is external hemorrhage and internal hemorrhage. External hemorrhage is something that which can which we actually see. That is either through a bruit or through an injury or through a wound, uh, this bl blood loss can be seen. Internal injury uh, can also cause uh, hemorrhage where there will be blood loss. This is called as internal hemorrhage or concealed hemorrhage. Technically, hemorrhage is nothing but ex escape of blood from the blood vessels. For example, when we are talking about various internal hemorrhages, these internal hemorrhages can be of uh, various types. For example, in case of peptic ulcer, we see internal bleeding can be seen in these cases. And uh, in case of ruptured ectopic gestation or in case of ruptured internal organs, in case of, uh, 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 we can also see perisac collection uh, fluid also. And in case of fractures of major bones also, we can see hemorrhage within the tissue spaces. And this can lead to hematoma formation within the tissue spaces. So this is called as internal hemorrhage or concealed hemorrhage. Now coming to based on the location of the hemorrhage, for example, if the causative is an arterial hemorrhage or if there is because if there is a rupture in the arteries uh, then or escape of blood from the arteries, then it is called as arterial hemorrhage. If there is a break in any of the breach in the continuity of your capillaries or if there is leakage of blood from the capillaries, then it is capillary hemorrhage and if such uh, leakage of blood occurs in case of venous uh, structure, then it is called as venous hemorrhage. Now again, based upon time period also, we'll, uh, we can actually categorize hemorrhage into acute hemorrhage or chronic hemorrhage. Acute hemorrhage is nothing but sudden loss of blood. Most common cause for this acute hemorrhage is trauma or in case of any accidents, in case of trauma or in case of any wound uh, which is freshly a fresh wound or in case of any surgeries, long standing surgeries, we can see this acute hemorrhage conditions. Chronic hemorrhage. Chronic hemorrhage is you know, during a long period of hemorrhage. I mean there is continuous blood loss or occasional blood loss in a period of time uh, for more than greater than three months of time or greater than three weeks of time also we can call it as chronic hemorrhage. Examples of chronic hemorrhage include peptic ulcers, hemorrhoids, varicose veins and esophageal varices where there will be hematemesis can also be called as chronic hemorrhages or chronic blood loss conditions. Sometimes what happens is we we'll, we doesn't know from where the there is hemorrhage where there is blood loss and it is like a hidden blood loss that conditions are called as occult hemorrhages or overt hemorrhages usually seen in usually a type of internal hemorrhages again. Now coming to time of appearance like at which time of uh, uh, at at what time of a wound or what time of an injury this kind of hemorrhage is happening they are again categorized as primary hemorrhage secondary hemorrhage or in between there is something called as reactionary hemorrhage primary hemorrhage is usually occurs at the time of operation or at the time of injury this is called as primary hemorrhage there is something called as reactionary hemorrhage reactionary hemorrhage usually occurs within 24 hours of time that is after completion of your surgery or after the uh, after any wound or trauma occurs within 24 hours i mean after the stoppage of hemorrhage at the particular point and within 24 hours if there is any hemorrhage it is called as reactionary hemorrhage most commonly reactionary hemorrhage occurs between 4 to 6 hours of time period this reactionary hemorrhage can occur because of an increased blood pressure within the body and it can also manifest during like when patient is coughing or when there is a uh, suture or ligature displacement then we can see this reactionary hemorrhage there is something called a secondary hemorrhage secondary hemorrhage usually occurs after seven days of your surgery usually within the range of seven days of surgery or seven days of wound closure usually the secondary hemorrhage occurs secondary hemorrhage usually occurs because of any secondary infection or because of necrosis of the arterial wall if there is a non-healing arterial wall or if there is any necrosis of the arterial wall or if there is any infection within the wound space then this secondary hemorrhage can occur. Usually when the secondary hemorrhage starts initially it gives us certain symptoms like the dressing of the wound but we can see certain blood stains on the dressing of the wound and then it actually the uh, hemorrhage starts in case of this secondary hemorrhage. So this is about the 
hemorrhage based upon time of appearance now coming to various clinical features of hemorrhage the first and foremost is whenever there is an external hemorrhage we can see bleeding and in case of acute blood loss what happens there will be increased pulse rate because heart uh, heart will uh, start pumping more amount of blood to compensate the loss of the blood and thus and thus there will be increased pulse rate there will be low blood pressure there will be restlessness increasing paleness as the amount of blood is lost there will be increased paleness there will be deep sighing respiration that is air hunger because of loss of blood the amount of hemoglobin that is the oxygen carrying uh, amount of hemoglobin is lost and thus the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is lost and patient or uh, the person who is on ac acute blood loss will have uh, more amount of oxygen demand so to compensate that there will be deep sighing respiration uh, which indicates air hunger now coming to continuous bleeding if there is continuous bleeding for a long period of time for for a particular period of time then patients usually uh, uh, exhibit with cold clammy extremities and also with empty veins in this condition pulse rate is an indicator is a better prognostic indicator for blood loss than blood pressure because pulse rate increases with blood loss in, in if in case of blood pressure what happens if there is acute hemorrhage also at initial stages blood pressure usually remains normal but as a uh, more amount of blood loss is seen then this blood pressure usually decreases in in cases but pulse rate always increases with blood loss so pulse rate is a better indicator of blood loss than blood pressure in excessive blood loss what happens is pulse rate becomes of low volume and it has a characteristic thready pulse appearance whenever we palpate for pulse it will be very of low volume and uh, uh, there will be particular thready pulse like appearance the urine output is usually low and in case of excessive hemorrhage patient can enter into hypovolemic shock and uh, and all the symptoms of shock again persist in those cases so how do we actually measure blood loss the amount of blood loss has to be replaced always so it is very important to know how much blood loss happened to replace that lost amount so there are various methods of measuring blood loss which include however uh, remember all the values that we are actually measuring are always 20% less than the actual blood loss this is because of drying away of the fluid which is present or drying away of uh, I mean, the loss of normal extracellular fluid from outside and the first and foremost thing is there will be uh, excess drying and there will be uh, the total blood volume that is which we have measured as blood loss would be 20% less than the actual blood loss so coming to various methods of weighing uh, of uh, measuring our blood loss first and foremost or most commonly used is weighing the swabs okay most commonly it is used in case of long standing operations or long duration operations or in between surgeries or surgeries of from moderate to more um, like major surgeries especially the peritoneal surgeries etc weighing of swabs will be helpful in identifying or measuring the loss of blood based on this replenishment of blood can be done in those patients so how do we actually weigh the swabs first when we are uh, taking this method weigh the swabs which are not being used that is the fresh swabs are weighed and the uh, weight of the swabs is noted now after uh, after using them i mean which are the blood soaked uh, swabs will be present all these blood soaked swabs are collected and weighed again the difference between this blood soaked swabs and the uh, fresh swabs which were not soaked with blood will give us the amount of blood loss but remember again this amount of blood loss is always less than the actual amount of blood loss as we know it is because of the evaporating of the blood or fluid from the uh, the watery content from the blood will actually give us less amount of weight so the swabs that have been collected the weight of the swabs how do we convert them into blood loss 1 gram of this uh, swab that is the weight of the swabs is equal to 1 ml of blood loss so that is how we calculate in case of moderate surgeries it has to be multiplied by 1 and 1/2 and in case of major surgeries it has to be multiplied by 2 as we know it is because of uh, because of excessive uh, drying of the blood now coming to measurement of swelling in the fractures in case of any internal fractures what happens blood does not come out because it is a concealed fracture so in those cases what happens there will be pooling of this blood into the extracellular spaces and also into the hemorrhage into the fracture set by identifying or measuring the amount of swelling there especially in case of closed fractures in tibia or closed fractures in the shaft of femur in those cases by measuring this swelling we can know the amount of blood loss that has been happened 
In closed fractures of tibia, it is usually about 1000 to 1500 ml of blood loss is encountered. And in case of closed fractures in the shaft of femur, then we can see about 1000 to 2000 ml of blood loss. Now coming to measurement of blood clot. Measurement of blood clot is again uh, one of the most commonly used method. In this what happens, the amount of clots that are present we have collected and it is measured against the fist of the person. It usually, uh, if it measures, uh, measures equal to the fist of the person, that means it is equal to 500 ml of blood loss. So this is how we actually measure blood loss by a blood clot. Now coming to determination of blood volume. As we know, blood volume is nothing but red cell volume plus plasma volume. So, I have to read this, it, it is with the help of a hematocrit, which actually, which actually gives us a ratio of plasma to red cells. By knowing this ratio of plasma to blood cells, then we can come back to calculating the total blood volume. Usually, this normal blood volume is about 80 ml of whole blood per kg body weight. So, Hemoglobin and central venous pressures are also often indicators, good indicators of this determination of blood volume. After diagnosing the amount of blood loss, after determine, determining the blood volume, then we come to the management aspect. So what is the primary objective of management of this hemorrhage? First and foremost is to stop the hemorrhage. Second is to restore the blood loss that has happened, that is to restore the blood volume. Coming to stopping of hemorrhage, it is nothing but hemostasis. We have various methods of hemostasis like systemic hemostasis and local measures of hemostasis. And coming to restoration of blood volume, it can be done by blood transfusion. That is why we require, uh, we require various methods of uh, measuring this blood loss. Next is crystalloid solution infusion and infusion of plasma and its substitutes. This will help in uh, replenishing the volume of blood. Coming to stoppage of blood. First thing is rest. Whichever site which has been uh, hemorrhaged or whichever site which has undergone uh, a trauma and it is bleeding profusely, give rest to the site. Do not move uh, the site of uh, injury. Absolute rest is required. Sedatives like morphine can be given IV or IM. But if there is respiratory distress in case of any brain injuries or head injuries, morphine is contraindicated. In those cases, we can go for chlorhydrate, which is uh, more beneficial when compared to morphine, especially in case of respiratory distress. Injection pethidine is also preferable in, uh, to morphine. These uh, drugs will help in alleviating pain and thus patient will have absolute rest in those conditions. Second thing is, if there is bleeding from the head end, always go for anti-Trendelenburg position. Anti-Trendelenburg position is nothing but elevating your head side and bringing down your legs down. This is called as anti-Trendelenburg position. Remember, if at all there is any injury to head, always have this anti-Trendelenburg position. That is, you are not allowing the blood to flow from this. You are moving it against gravity. And second thing is, if there is blood bleeding or hemorrhage from the foot end, then go for Trendelenburg position. Trendelenburg position is nothing but legs up and head down position. So this will also bring back your, uh, uh, prevent the peripheral pooling of blood and bring back, the, bring back the blood into circulation and also helps in perfusion of brain. So these two conditions are very, uh, these two positions are very important in case of stopping hemorrhage. Now coming to pressure and packing, very, very important step in preventing hemorrhage in especially as a local measure. If it is a first aid treatment, always have a pressure band. For example, there is an injury, put amount of pressure there for at least 5 minutes without checking it for, uh, I mean without removing your hand or pressure for checking whether the bleeding has stopped. Complete 5 minute blood pressure, a complete 5 minute pressure has to be given there to prevent that bleeding of blood. I mean to prevent the bleeding, uh, bleeding from the site. Now coming to use of tourniquet, this is uh, usually obsolete nowadays, uh, not very useful because what happens is when we are tying a tourniquet, we are, we, are pre we are preventing blood flow to the peripheral tissue thus causing more damage because it results in ischemia. Next, we have various bandages like a smart bandage also. Coming to operative uh, methods, we can use artery forceps or hemostats or mosquito forceps where we can ligate the uh, first isolate or identify the uh, artery or capillary or vein which has been the cause for bleeding and ligate it or uh, by ligating with the help of artery forceps we can stop bleeding. Next is ligation of artery with the help of cat gut or silk. Cat gut or uh, silk will uh, usually prevent in uh, further bleeding 
and then diathermy where a small amount of heat is applied there which coagulates the uh, bleeding uh, spots or, and this is especially used for case of smaller arteries which will also cause hemostasis. Then in case of renal artery or vein transfixation, silk sutures can be used. If there is any oozing type of bleeding, in those cases local styptics like oxycell, surgicell, gelatin sponge or gauze soaked in adrenaline will be helpful in preventing excessive bleeding. Other uh, uh, types like stipfen or russell viper poison also helps in bleeding because it coagulates the local side. And then if there is bleeding from the bone, then go for bone wax. Just uh, put some amount of wax onto the bone surface and uh, this can prevent bleeding from the bone uh, from the region. However, by using bone wax, what happens? Sometimes there can be secondary infection again because of uh, granulomatous formation around this. Next, in cases of bleeding from solid viscous, in case of solid organs, if there is any bleeding, then excise it. If there is excessive bleeding from spleen, go for splenectomy or partial hepatectomy if in case of liver or nephrectomy. This will stop bleeding because uh, this will stop especially the internal bleeding which can damage other organs also. Now coming to chronic hemorrhage. It is nothing but small quantity of hemorrhage for a long period of time. There are various examples like as we have seen hemorrhoids, peptic ulcer, carcinoma of cecum etc can lead to chronic hemorrhage. Here what happens is usually blood volume is never diminished. We come to know, sometimes we come to know only when the this loss of blood, the chronic loss of blood equals to very severe manifestations. Only when they actually give us severe manifestations, most of the times in those cases only this chronic hemorrhage can be det detected. Otherwise, the blood volume is usually normal in case of chronic hemorrhage. The red cell volume may be diminished in these cases. Microcytic hypochromic anemia is a common feature in case of chronic hemorrhages. There will be high output cardiac failure because the uh, high output cardiac failure even then the blood volume is usually uh, either greater than normal or almost equal to the normal levels. What do we do? How do we manage? It is by particle replacement than whole blood. In this case as we know as a whole blood volume is not diminished only the red cells or the uh, cellular uh, red cell volume only is diminished. In those cases we can go with the Pack the cell replacement in managing this chronic hemorrhagic clinical features. Now coming to natural restoration of blood volume. Usually nature itself replenishes the blood volume whenever there is a hemorrhage, immediately after hemorrhage. What it does is, it maintains the blood flow to vital organs, to brain and to other important vital organs of the body. There will be interstitial fluid which is absorbed back into the blood to maintain the blood volume. But what happens in those cases, because of Taking this extracellular fluid into the into the vascular space, into the vascular uh, column or into the blood vessel, there will be hemodilution. Because of this hemodilution, plasma proteins uh, have to be replaced again by the liver. So in this mechanism, the blood volume is still maintained though there is hemorrhage. Red cell recovery takes place usually in about five to six weeks of time. So in those cases, there can be anemia uh, until there is complete replenishment of red cells. In those cases, what we do? We either do blood transfusion, infusion of crystalloid. This infusion of crystalloid will be helpful in maintaining the blood volume and plasma or plasma substitutes also will be useful in maintaining the blood volume. So this is about hemorrhage, various types of hemorrhage and how do we actually manage those uh, various hemorrhagic conditions. Now coming to hemostasis in particular. Hemostasis is nothing but uh, uh, where we actually prevention of blood with the help of clotting. So what is the natural uh, mechanism of this hemostasis is first thing is by vasoconstriction due to local release of thromboxane. In this picture we can see there is an injury to the blood vessel where the blood vessel is severed. Immediately after severed of this blood vessel what happens the blood and blood components are, are being uh, changed I mean are being moving out into the uh, leaking, uh, leaking out of this breaks into the tissue spaces. In those conditions immediately after this there will be vascular spasm where the smooth muscle of the vessel wall contracts. That is nothing but vasoconstriction, especially near the injury point and this will reduce the blood loss into the next place. There what happens, there will be a platelet plug formation because of this uh, vasoconstriction and various thromboxane releases. As the thromboxane is released, it, has, uh, it will activate the platelets and platelets are aggregated to this region and when they are, uh, when they are uh, called into the site of injury, they are aggregated and the addition happens there and they form something called as platelet plug. 
Initial platelets, initially the platelets will be activated with the chemicals that are released and by the injured cells and by the contact with the broken collagen. Once they, these bound plas, uh, platelets release some chemicals, these chemicals will further attract other platelets and now this forms a platelet plug there. Once the platelet plug is formed, it will start a, uh, it will actually uh, have this coagulation mechanism. In the coagulation what happens, the fibrinogen is converted into fibrin. Where, when the fibrinogen is converted into fibrin, it forms a mesh that wraps more amount of platelets and erythrocytes. Thus, it forms nothing but a clot. Now, this fibrin strands which have been uh, secured, this fibrin strands which secure the platelets and the erythrocytes will effectively start plugging the severed uh, blood vessel and it will start plugging your break within the blood vessel. This is how natural hemostasis mechanism happens. To help this natural hemostasis mechanism, we have to, we have a coagulation cascade. This coagulation cascade has actually the earlier coagulation cascade method was waterfall mechanism. Now it is cell based theory. In this cell based theory, we have uh, contact activation and tissue factor that is extrinsic pathway activation, which will finally give rise to, will uh, finally help uh, and we have a common pathway that is intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway, which means to form a common pathway and finally it will help in formation of fibrin thus forming the platelet plug. Now coming to various bleeding disorders. We have seen hemostasis. We have seen how this hemostasis actually occurs with the help of extrinsic, intrinsic and common pathway that is the coagulation cascade. If at all there is some disorder within this coagulation cascade, if at all there is some disorder within the vessel wall, we can see various amount, various uh, types of bleeding disorders. Bleeding disorders are usually due to alteration in the ability of blood vessels the ability of platelets to aggregate or in the ability of coagulation factors to maintain the hemostasis. Now, we have a classification of these bleeding disorders which is non-thrombocytopenic purpuric uh, bleeding or thrombocytopenic purpuric, uh, purpurous uh, bleeding disorders. In case of non-thrombocytopenic purpuras, we have vessel wall alteration. This vessel wall alteration disorders include scurvy, any autoimmune condition, it can have any infectious diseases or patients who are on steroid therapies, especially Cushing syndrome. In case of disorder of platelet function, we have various conditions like genetic defects and Bernard Solier disease, drugs, certain allergies and autoimmune conditions. When we are talking about thrombocytopenic purpura, we have primary thrombocytopenic purpura or secondary thrombocytopenic purpura. Primary is nothing but idiopathic, whereas secondary thrombocytopenic purpura includes various conditions like any chemicals, physical agents, like radiation, metastatic tumors, splenomegaly, some drugs which will cause thrombocytopenic purpuras like NSAIDs, vasculitis, in case of mechanical prosthetic heart walls, if there is splenomegaly, systemic diseases like leukemia, etc. can cause thrombocytopenic purpura in these conditions. Now, this is about hemostasis and just a brief uh, uh, in, uh, input about how Hemostasis occurs naturally, that is natural uh, method of hemostasis because of vas uh, vasoconstriction uh, and platelet plug formation. And we have seen a few diseases, a classification of diseases just for information about various uh, coagulation disorders in this picture. So by this we conclude types of hemorrhage and hemostasis mechanism.